Praise the Lord. I'll tell you, it makes such a difference when we can really get our eyes off of ourselves and onto His, who He is and what it's all about. I just praise God this morning for His, His presence, the reality of what we're singing about. May God help us to really get it more than we do. I came into uh, yesterday morning, still didn't really have much of a clue as to what this was about today. But uh, I don't know, I had, a, I had just a germ of a thought and just tried to ask the Lord to kind of set it in its context. I'm going to go ahead and read and skim my way through the first couple of chapters of Hebrews, certainly very familiar scripture, but mainly because it's the context for the thought. It's always good, I believe, to have a knowledge of scripture itself, but we need to see I believe with all my heart the thought that the Lord has stressed to me this morning, because I need it as much as you do, uh, that we need to see it in its context. We need, to, we need to really get the big picture. That's what we've been singing about this morning. The big picture is not about us and how we feel and how we're doing. The big picture is, is our, the greatness of our God and who He is and what He's done. Because if we lean on that, we've got everything we need. Praise God. So the book of Hebrews... Uh, was written to Jews. They had known, of course, the traditions of the Jews and the, their religion and the, that they inherited from Moses. It was one of following laws and trying to attain righteousness before God through that means. And uh, that was not what God had in mind. His, God always had planned a new covenant that was not going to be like the old one. This was a covenant in which uh, the sins would be put away and everyone would know him in a personal way. Uh, it, was a, it was a divine provision that, was, that, was, that came through Jesus Christ. And uh, for one reason or another, you know, we have a hard time leaving what we know, leaving stuff behind. Every one of us comes to the Lord with a context of our lives and what we have settled into and sort of this is my place, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. It's hard to leave all of that. And that really is, is an underlying thought in where I'm going with this. But this was the problem with the Jews. They were having a hard time letting go of the old and really understanding what God was doing and the greatness of it. And so the way the writer begins the book, he begins by comparing Jesus Christ with angels in the beginning. And then he compares him with Moses. And, you know, there's a comparison going on so we can see the superiority of what God is doing now. Makes it easier to say, yep, yeah, this is what God's about. Leave the other behind. This was always intended to point to that. So the first part, he is comparing the Son of God with angels. And so he says, and the reason he's doing that, by the way, is that angels were very central to the ministration of the law in the Old Testament. In fact, he says in one place, it was ministered by angels. And how much greater then is what we have now because that was ministered by Christ who was greater than the angels. So you get the logic where he's going with this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Boy, that's a good thought that we all need to get, get our, wrap our brains around if we can even begin to do it. How easily do we sink into our littleness and forget who, it, who our Savior is? You know, and, and we, it's, it's wonderful to think of him, to remember him as the one who walked the shores of Galilee and had such a compassion for sinners, and we see his heart. We see the heart of God really in him and through him. Of course, he was one with that. But we see that in him. But to realize who this really is, you go back before there was a world. He is the one who spoke the words. He is the one who created everything. I don't know if you remember several years ago, we, we used a, uh, we must have, must have uh, portrayed it or, or literally projected it. But I did a comparison of, of star sizes and some of the, to show just the greatness of the universe. And, uh, we came to a point where there was one star that they know about that is so immense that if you put it, if you centered it where our sun is, which is 93 million miles from us, 
we would be way inside of that star. The surface of that star would be out somewhere near Jupiter. I mean, you talk about the immensity of the universe and the and amazing things that, that were uh, executed by Jesus. The one we know is Jesus. He was the one who, who built that star. And all of the innumerable stars beyond that. And, you know, our sun is a very ordinary little star kind of on the grand scheme of things. And yet more than a million Earths, if that were just a globe, a hollow globe, more than a million Earths would fit inside that. I mean, you, just, you can go on and on and on describing the greatness of the universe and the, the fact that nobody's ever really discovered the end of it. And it's not just the number of stars, it's the number of galaxies of stars, every one of which probably has 100 million or more stars in them. I mean, this is the, this is the one who literally fashioned that. He built that star that was that so, so great and put it in its orbit and set it in motion. This is, a, this is somebody, this is not some small being like we tend to think of him. We, we humanize him and bring him way down almost and, and hope he can get us through. But I'll tell you, this is somebody who from the foundation, before the foundation of the world was there with the Father, he is the creator. So, you know, we need to set our, our issues in the light of who he is. And it's not only that. Of course, you want to know what God is like. Again, we've said this many times. You look at Jesus. God, in his essence, is a spirit who fills all the universe. You can never see him. He's just too great. He's in another realm. But he focused all of his goodness, all of his being, in the, in the person of his son, so you can find out exactly what the Father is like. You just look at him. He is the exact representation of the being of the Father. Okay, so there's an absolute oneness. But it goes beyond that, doesn't it? He sustains everything. You want to know why the, why the stars stay in their orbits? Because he says so. That's what he says. He sustains all things by his powerful word. You think his word is powerful enough to help us today? Praise God I want to be listening to this. And I've, I face the same issues that you do. But I'll tell you, we've got, a, we've got somebody who is on our side <laughs> who is absolutely undergirding everything that we are about here this morning. Without this person, we are help helpless. This is not religion here. This is a person. His name is Jesus. He represents the heart of the Father in carrying out the purpose that he conceived before the world was. Okay? So now he begins to talk about his, his superiority to angels because God never said to an angel, you are my son, today I have become your father. And he goes on and talks about uh, that does that comparison over and over again. He's greater than any of the angels. And in verse 8, but about the Son, he says, your throne, O God. You want to know about the deity of Christ? There it is. But about the Son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. <laughs> this world won't, but he will. And righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And then he goes on about the, the creation. He says, in the beginning, O Lord, you, this is Jesus he's talking about, remember, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. But now, listen to what he says, they will perish, but you remain. It's not just Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. He won't. There is an eternality about him. There is a temporariness even about the, the material creation that we are a part of. It, got, it fell into corruption because of man. That's what, that's what God is rescuing. But look at how he describes this, the poetic way. He says, they will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. I mean, you know, doing away with this universe and coming up with another one is like God changing his clothes. Roll it up. Okay, I'm done with this. It's worn out. Let's put, some, put on something better. But all, all what he's going to put on will, will last forever. But you remain the same. That means he's the same here. Jesus Christ is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. And of course, the, the the command of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord. 
It says, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Okay? So you get the idea pretty plainly that Jesus is way superior to the angels. Okay, so that's, that is where he goes here with this. Says, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. That was the danger he saw. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, he's talking about the law, if that was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This is destiny stuff here. This is what, it's, it's, this is what everything is about. This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So God didn't spare anything to, to give testimony to what he was doing. It, the testimony was his son, the resurrection of his son, the witness of those who saw all this, and then on top of that, the supernatural intervention by their being able to do miracles and all kinds of signs and wonders that, that came along and God saying, yeah, listen, this is my word, this is my covenant. Signs and wonders were never meant to be the center. You don't worship a sign, the sign is pointing to something. And the sign was pointing to the message that God wanted men to get. That's his heart. Okay? And, of course, then he, then he talks about how uh, God's purpose is not to take the world that is to come and give it over to the angels. That's not theirs to run. God's purpose from eternity is, has to do with man. What is man that you are mindful of him? Now, he's quoting from the Psalms. The son of man that you care for him. David is just trying to look around and say, my God, this, this almost doesn't make sense to me. Who are we that you should care about us like this? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, and you put everything under his feet. That's a key word. Put everything under his feet. I mean, that's, that was God's idea in the beginning. That was his plan, that he would create this amazing creation, all the, the, the creatures that there were and all the, the stuff in this world, and we would be absolutely in charge of that. There wouldn't be a single thing that would not be under our dominion until we decided we were going to do it our, our way, and then everything went to hell in a handbasket. But anyway, and he put everything under his feet. Now, listen to what he says. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. I see, you know, God is trying to make an emphasis upon this. This is our... This is the destiny. This is the purpose for which mankind was created in the beginning. We were created to be his sons and his daughters, to rule over a creation and not mess it up. All right, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, obviously. <laughs> pretty much, it's, it's a pretty scary world, isn't it? And boy, the, I'll tell you, mankind worships this world, don't they? Some of them. Oh, I'll tell you, you know, it's a good thing to be a steward of the world and to, be, and to have, you know, respect the creation. But I'll tell you, when you start worshiping that, when you start serving this as though, oh, my God, we've got to preserve this, God's already marked a day when he is going to burn it up. This is not what it's about. There is something to come that we won't have any problem trying to keep. It will be perfect. We will be able to rule over it and enjoy it. And it'll be, there won't be any death, there won't be any pain, there won't be any suffering, there won't be any of this stuff. That's, what God, that's where God's going with everything. So rather than seeing everything subject to man right now, what, what do we see? We see Jesus. Now, what about him? Who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You want, you want to know how he did it? <laughs> God was there. It was God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But think of the one who fashioned that immense star and all the galaxies, who put them in their orbits, designed all of this, willing to come down and live in human flesh like we have? To him be the glory. 
To him be the glory. Boy, we want to humble ourselves over the littlest thing. And look what he did. And he, he didn't do it for people that were worthy. He did it for people who were in rebellion and darkness and every, with every possible thing wrong. You see his heart? His very name, Jesus, means God saves. It comes straight from the heart of our Heavenly Father who is loyal to his original purpose. So he comes down, and he doesn't come down and wear a crown, at least not the kind that we would expect. He wore one of thorns, represented the very curse that was upon this creation. Made lower than the angels so that he could taste death for everyone. Well, you know, that's our, isn't that great, our greatest enemy? The Word calls it the last enemy. It's going to be destroyed one day. There won't be any more death. But this is, this is man's greatest enemy, what we fear the most. In fact, that's where we're going. But anyway, he came down to face and to taste our greatest enemy. So here's, here's, here's what follows up with that. He says, in bringing many sons to glory. Oh, my God. To take somebody like us and so work in us that one day we could stand there radiant as the sun. I mean, so bright that a natural person could not even look, would have to get out one of those filters you look at when you, when you see a, uh, an eclipse or something. They, they won't even, they'll be able to not even look at us. They won't be able to look at us. You think we're going to stand there and say, look what I did. They're going to say, oh, my God, how great thou art. How great thou art. Lord, to take somebody like us and do that. What an amazing God you are, bringing many sons to glory. I'm so glad he didn't bring us this, this far to leave us. You know, we sing the song. <laughs> he is able to bring us every step of the way, all the way to glory. It was fitting. This was the right thing for God to do. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect or complete through suffering. It's amazing that as great as he was, as amazing as he was before the foundation of the world, doing all of that creative stuff, this glorious, pow all-powerful being who could do all of those things, he still wasn't all that he needed to be to help us. It wasn't enough. It wasn't complete until he was willing to taste death and to gather upon himself our, all that was wrong with us, all of our guilt, and stand there in our place. And, and, and it wasn't just what he did at the cross. It was all his life, living out a life where he was willing to live in a body like we have and yet trust God and, le and lean upon his strength and live a perfect life. Never sinned. What an, but, but doing it in the context, doesn't it say in, was it chapter 5, he learned obedience? There was something he didn't know without coming down here. It's one thing to sit up there and say, well, I know what it is to obey God. Sure, there wasn't anything in him that didn't want to. But to come down here and to partake of, of the flesh that we all have that doesn't want to obey God and have to learn how to say, I'm going to do it anyway, not my will, but yours be done. That's what it took for him to be complete, completely able and ready to be the kind of a Savior we need. Isn't that an interesting word that he uses in there, the author? Where else do you see that word? How about in chapter 12? The author and the finisher of our faith. It happens to be the same word in Greek. You, go, you want to know where everything originates that will carry us through? It originates in him. But he so willingly, lovingly shares all that he has, all that he is, so that he can bring us not just to this point and say, well, now it's up to you, 
but all the way through until we stand there before him. You see the greatness of what the author here and the Lord through the author is sharing with these people. You want to stay down here and, and walk in that religion that just leaves you helpless and hopeless to, to ever measure up? You want to try to be righteous by keeping laws? Look at what Jesus, look at what you're walking away from. This is what it's all about. This is what the entire purpose of this creation is about. It's God gathering a family, and this is the way that he's doing it. He's going to bring us out of a state of sin and death and rebellion and absolutely change us into his sons and his, I mean, there's a birth that happens there. All right, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So now it's not just simply a relationship with a Savior and a bunch of people. This is a family thing. Now, what's he, what's he conveying by that? What's the relationship of the Son to the Father? I mean, it's a dumb question. Obviously, he's born. <laughs> He literally shares his life. There is a, a family relationship. But that is the relationship God desires for every single one of us, as inconceivable as that sounds, that we too should be born of his spirit and be able, have, have that capacity in us to grow up to be his children just like his son. I know that's, it's just... I don't get it. I'm here in the middle here, and it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't look like it. See, that's, what we've, that's where we're at. That's what we need to overcome. But do you see how important it is to get the big picture before you start di diving into the issues of life? Oh, we need to see that, God, that he calls us brothers and sisters, and he's not ashamed. That's what it says. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. There's so many times, I, you know, if I go by how I feel and how I perform, Lord, how in the world? You've got to be ashamed to call me a brother. How in the world could you not despise me right now? But it says he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, of course. That word takes in both. And, of course, he quotes some Old Testament scriptures in support of that. I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises, and again, I will put my trust in him. Isn't that interesting? Instead of being up here looking down, he's down here saying, I'm trusting him. I'm trusting him too. God calls you to trust him. That's my place too. I'm trusting my Father in his purpose to carry out everything that's in his heart to do. But I'm not up here looking down my nose at you. I am down here with my arm around your shoulder to lead you there. That's a different picture, isn't it? But isn't that what he's trying to convey? Why would he talk about us being a family and him being our brother if it wasn't meant to convey that? But do you see what it takes to be part of this? You better be born of his spirit. This is what the writer was concerned about, that these people would would still stay in the realm of religion. Which religion am I going to practice? Am I going to add Jesus to this? Or am I going to, you know, where am I going to land here with my religious practice? Because by that, I expect God to accept me. That's not what it's about. We've got to come to the end of everything where we just say, Lord, there's only one hope that I have, that you will impart to me brand new life that I wasn't born with. I need to be born again. I need to have you coming and residing in my heart, not just in my head, in my external practice, but, you need, but my life needs to belong to you. That's what makes us family. That's what makes us family. That's the, that's the ground of everything. So anyway, well, above that, he says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. Do you know who was here this morning singing with us? It's wonderful that he's up there, but I'll tell you, by virtue of his union with the Father, he is here too. His, the presence of his Spirit is, is right here anointing and helping us to worship him. Oh, this is a need that I feel, to be freer and to, re and to reckon on that, to rest in that, 
Not to strive, but to say, Lord, you're here. Lord, energize our worship, energize our prayer, every, energize everything that we do so that it's not just a people being religious, but it's Christ living in the hearts of his people. That's what it's all about. And then he says, talks about pretty much putting our trust in him. And here am I and the children God has given me. This, is, this is, goes right to the throne. All right? So now he gets into our situation. Since the children have flesh and blood, that's us, he too shared in their humanity. All right, why did he do that? So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. This is the thought that came to me this morning. I'll guarantee there's not a person here, who, even those who know the Lord, those who know the Lord for years, where there's not areas of captivity and slavery in your life. And yet here is Jesus who died to break that. But what is the issue that keeps every one of us in some area or another, what is it that keeps us in that place? It's fear of death. Now, this is not what you would think on the surface, that, oh, I'm afraid to die. I don't want somebody to put a bullet in my head, or I don't want to get on a hospital bed and die. That's not what it's talking about. Everything about human nature from the time that Adam and Eve sinned has involved a fear in here that this is all I have, this is all I know, I cannot lose this, or I have, left, I have lost everything. What was the first reaction of Adam and Eve after they had sinned? And Jesus, it was, the one we now know as Jesus, was the one who came walking in the garden to come down and fellowship with them and share the glory of what, what had been created. What did he do? What was, what was his reaction to that? It was fear. It was hiding. It was a, a sense of, I, I'm afraid. I, I can't handle this. I, what, what, what is, you know, ever, ever since the human race, the most in, inborn instinct that we have is to cling to our life in some form. And it's not just laying it down in, the, in what we call death. It's laying it down in every aspect as we live. We just don't want to let go of self. And fear is the tool that the devil uses. There are a gazillion, I mean, you could, you could write an encyclopedia, I suppose, about all of the lies the devil tells us. But I'll tell you, fear is... Fear is part of the human equation, isn't it? They even make comedies about it. How many of you remember Monk? Crazy detective. And they, they made so much of a joke out of it. He said, there's 67 phobias I have. 67 things I'm, I'm definitely afraid of. Anyway, but I'm afraid it's not a funny thing, is it? We are afraid to let go. And I, I guarantee if you've walked with the Lord any, any length of time, there is things where you have learned to say, yes, Lord, I surrender. And the result of that is what? It's peace, isn't it? But do we not sing songs like The Secret Place? There's a place in my heart where even I don't go. And we don't want to even let the Lord in there. We're just afraid. We're ashamed. We're or, or it's something that's so deeply rooted in us, we just can't let it go, or we can't really believe God would love us. We, what, what are the, where are the lies? I mean, the lies just go on and on and on. This is Satan's attack against every one of us. And one of the biggest ones, I mean, it could be it's so many things, but one of the biggest things is a performance-based thinking. I mean, we certainly talked about this enough where I cannot conceive of a relationship with God that is not somehow based upon my performance. And since my performance is not very 
perfect, where does that leave me most of the time? That leaves me in a place of shrinking back, hiding. I can't really go to him now. I'll clean up and then I'll come see you later, Lord, when I've, you know, gotten things right. How, I mean, you can, you can couch this in so many different ways, but it's the same basic thing where we cannot really, we get so bogged down in all of this that's going on and all that we feel and the sense of unworthiness that we forget all about the greatness of the one that we are serving and what he has done. We forget what Paul said in Romans 8, that he who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely with him give us all things? And somehow we are stuck in the Old Testament. Trying to, win our, trying to win our place in heaven. And so many times we get stuck in these places where there's areas in our heart we're afraid to let go. But we're, when we're afraid to let them go, does that not keep us down in Satan's little jail cell? And if we're down in that realm, does he not have an access to us that he wouldn't if we got out of there? And so what you wind up with is a vicious cycle of staying in a weak place. Because of our weakness, we fall into whatever the weakness is. And then we can't go to him because we commit because of the weakness. And round and round and round it goes. And there's always this sense of distance between us and the Lord. And we're afraid. You know, there's examples in nature. I happened to read a commentary that, that of all things, happened, on, happened to be on Fox News. And a guy was talking about how God just cut out his, I forget how he put it, but God just really brought him down. And he was glad. And he came to a place in his whatever, his whatever he was doing where he thought he was on track, everything was going great, and then boom. It all came apart, and he's wondering, what in the world is going on? Why did God do this to me? What's going on? Does he really like me? And I, I think he actually witnessed this. If I'm not mistaken, I'd have to go back and read it. But basically, it came down to observing a mother bird. And she had three chicks whatever they call them anyway, the young ones, that were, and it was about the time where they were supposed to leave the nest, but they didn't want to go. And so the picture was she had them lined up on a branch and kept pushing and shoving and doing everything in her power to, to make them let go and they'd say, I ain't going. <laughs> uh-uh. I have had it good up here. <laughs> I'm comfortable I, I'm afraid, I'm afraid of, I mean, this is not perfect, but this is better than that because <laughs> I don't know what's coming. And so she finally, he watched her. She finally would push the first one off, and they fell, and they're tumbling, and all of a sudden, oh, yeah, I can fly before they hit the ground. And one by one, they came, they, they, she did that, and the last one, oh, man, it was a battle. That one just did not want to let go. I won't do it. I won't, I won't. But isn't that a picture of us? And, you know, we've had the, had the picture of, I mean, has the Lord been doing that to anybody trying to stir up your nest? That's another illustration of the same thing. And we don't want to let go. We, we want to, you know, we get used to things. I mentioned that earlier. You can do it religiously. You can come from a religious background and that to you is right. So now you're going to measure everything by that. Instead of saying, Lord, I don't know. You know, when Sue and I came into the work here, there were things we had to walk away from. Thank God. I'm glad we did. I, there was a heritage I believe I got from my dad. He was willing to walk away from a lot too. Because the loyalty was never to me and my ideas, my, wor my religious heritage or whatever it is, it's to him. And so there always has to be a willingness to say, Lord, 
I don't know, and I certainly don't know everything there is to know, but you lead me. If it's in here, if it's right, that's what I want to believe. Period. Wherever that takes me, Lord, this, is, this takes precedence over me and what I want and what I think. And I'll tell you, that goes a long way. But we love, in, in one sense, we, or we fearfully cling, I guess is what I, what I mean to say, to where we're at. And even though it may not be quite wonderful, there is such a thing as becoming so used to something that we would rather stay there even though it's not that great than venture into something where we don't know. But isn't that what God calls us to do? You know, Ben mentioned the other night, talked about the God's called us to change. Well, change <laughs> does not, not mean leaving something to go to something else. But, Lord, I can't leave that. That's all I know. I, you know, I know things aren't great. I know I've struggled in this area, but I'm still comfortable here. Better the devil I know. This is human nature. This is an issue at the bottom of, of many of our, of our lives and why we're where we're at. We just don't want to let go. We don't realize the hold of this earthly mentality, this earthly nature, how readily does it cling to our prison cell and call that home? I mean, you see it in so many places, the fear that, that absolutely bound people. The Israelites were so afraid when they saw the giants and heard about the giants, I guess. What do they want to do? They wanted to go back to Egypt. Now, they spent... A long time down there, years and years and years, toiling under the, under the, in slavery, crying out, oh, God, deliver us. And when he did, and when they saw what it meant, even though it was obvious that God would be with them if they only had their eyes opened, they were ready to go back. And I'll tell you, God is going to put us in situations where it's going to look scary. The devil is going to focus our attention on how fearful this is. What the prospect of reaching out and knowing you better. God, I, don't, I can't afford to get too close to you. I'm, I'm, too, I'm too something. I'm too dirty. I'm too unworthy. I'm too, oh, poor me. You wouldn't want to be around me. You see, you see how the devil works? That's all he's got. The one who's on our side is the one who formed those stars, who came down, calls us brothers. See, what, see why this needs to be in context? He goes on to talk about how he's been tempted in every way like we have, yet without sin. He can understand. He calls us to a throne over in chapter 4 of grace and mercy. And yet here we are. Oh, God, I'm afraid. And we're listening to the voice of the enemy. Why was it that, that, da that, that David could face Goliath as a young man all by himself and the rest of the army was shrinking in terror? Just fear, unbelief. There's so, many issues, there's so many sides to this, I don't even know where to go with it. But I just, I just pray that God will somehow get this, this across. I thought of so many things, and they just, they just vanished out of my mind. That's perfectly all right. I'm not afraid of that. <laughs> God is so faithful to help his people. But God wants us to lift our eyes out and realize what, what is really going on. The devil is talking you and me into staying where we're at rather than reaching out. Oh, I can't. He, you know, this, this, that, or the other. we got a thousand and one reasons for staying where we're at, and all we're doing is clinging to self. Whether it's pride, whether it's unbelief, whether whatever it is, whatever the particular flavor of that lie is, and I'll tell you, there's a God who wants to reach out. And he's not saying, well, you down there, what's the matter with you? Get with it. What is it that drives out fear? Is it 
a tongue lashing? It's perfect love casts out fear. And you go to John, 1 John, in the context of that, what he's talking about is a legalistic relationship with God where my performance is what determines my confidence toward God. And if I don't measure up, I'm afraid, and I don't want to get too close to him because I know how he's bound to feel about me because of this. I can't, I'm, I can't get close to him now. Anybody here who ever gets in that place that would admit it? But there he is, knowing exactly where we're at and what we're made of, calling us to come, not because we, are, we deserve it, because we need him. It's love that reaches down into the, to the lowest of the low and say, I have the power. I made the stars. You don't think I can help you? You don't think I care? I showed you that on the cross. I went to the cross in your place, and you're, you're afraid I won't like you now? I knew what you were all about. I knew everything that was wrong with you. And yet we struggle, don't we? I'll tell you the answer, I believe with all my heart, really is hinted at more in this passage than, other, than, than it is in other places. With where he goes at the end of this chapter, in the beginning of the next chapter, because you have that transitional word, therefore. He's laid out a whole lot of truth. Here's what God has done. Here's who we're dealing with. Here's where we're at. Here's the, the reason we're in trouble is because we're afraid and we're going to cling to what we, what we know instead of, latch, instead of letting that go. We better look at Jesus. It says, therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, what are we supposed to do? Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. I'll tell you, the more we look at him, the more we're going to see the immensity of who he is and, and his power and his love more than anything. What did Paul pray in, in Ephesians chapter 3? He says, I want you to get it. I want you to understand the immensity of, of his love, the height, the depth, and all of that. I want you to explore that because when we do that, it sets us free from that fear of letting go and of trusting him. Oh, God, I can't let that go. I can't even bring that into the light, let alone let it go. I can't admit that, to my, even to myself. I can't, you know, you see where we're stuck in our little, our little cage. I started to talk about how where we stay becomes our comfort zone. That was something that Shelley shared the other night. Or Michelle, sorry. <laughs> Your adult name. I remember her when she was Shelley. But what a blessed testimony that was the other night of how God will take us to places that are not in our comfort zone. But the very fact that we have a comfort zone tells us exactly what he's talking about here. My comfort zone is I'm afraid of anything else. Don't ask me to get outside of this. I'm uncomfortable here. I've, it's not great, but it's, so, it's what I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'll get through. I'll muddle through. And the Lord's saying, I got better for you. You're in a cage, but the door's open, for crying out loud. I mean, how many times have you seen or heard about situations where perhaps a, an animal was kept in a cage? And there they are, and week after week, and month after month, and year after year, all they can do is pace back and forth, and that's all they know, and they get fed and all of that. And one day the door is open. What does the animal do? Generally, he's just going to keep on doing what he's been doing. But Jesus has opened the door and invited us to step out. And here we are, listening to the voice that makes us afraid to do anything different, to come to him as we are and know that he will receive us. When I say as we are, I don't mean clinging to my sins and wanting to continue in them. I mean, oh God, I need help. I need you, Lord. I need you to come and change me. Do for me what I cannot do. So many times, sometimes God has to let us really get in the mud before we'll really, really come to that and realize it's that serious. We just need him. 
But I'll tell you, everything about salvation is, is so awesome on the one hand, but we fight it all the way. Don't we? Do we not fight God all the way home? There is that in us that resists, that fights, that holds back, that, that defaults to unbelief, sometimes stubbornness, a lot of stuff. God is so, he's the only one who knows how to get past all that. He must laugh sometimes. And I'll tell you what, I believe he's grieved sometimes, but I, I believe he laughs because he knows what it's going to take. But folks, we don't, we don't know, understand the half of what he's delivering us from. You know, Jesus came and lived an earthly life, and here we are. Our nature is to fear death. But he took up his cross long before he went to the cross. He lived for the will of his Father. He did not live to gratify human desires and all those kinds of things. He lived for God, and then he willingly laid down his life, the very opposite of our nature. How did that work out for him? Did he not show us the very pathway to glory? It does not come from preserving self, staying in the cage of fear. It comes from, from reaching out and worshiping God and letting him have his way and I'll tell you, there's a God who will not only open the door of our cage, but will walk in there and say, I know how you feel, but let's get out of here. You don't have to listen to that voice anymore. I did not give you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I've given you everything that you need. Get out of your cage. Understand what's happening, why, the, why you're where you're at, and why things are such a struggle. It's because you're hanging on to yourself, and you're doing it because you're afraid. How many movies do you see on TV where you get into situations, why are you acting that way? And then somebody finally opens up, because I'm scared. And that's, that's almost the last thing you would have expected them, judging by how they were acting. We do so many things to cover up what's really the, what's, what the real problem is. We're afraid. We don't want to let go. But I'll tell you, God has shown us the way in his son. He has opened the door where we can let go. Because there's nothing that stands between us and a holy God. Jesus has removed that barrier forever. We have the right to come to him to say, devil, I don't have to listen to you anymore. That voice that causes me to feel afraid, I do not have to listen to that anymore. He didn't give me that kind of a spirit, and I refuse to listen to you. Father, I trust you. Lord, I trust you with my heart and my life. Do, what, do what's necessary. Look at David in Psalm, was it 139? He goes on and on and on talking about how God knows everything about him. Now, to most people, that's a scary thing. I mean, you know, we're just so stupid that we'll go along and there'll be something that nobody knows about and we'll just kind of keep it hid almost like God doesn't even know about this one. <laughs> I mean, duh. But here's David coming to a place where he realizes God does know everything. He knows it before I know it. And he thinks about me. His thoughts are like the grains of sand. So what is his reaction to that? Oh, my God, I am terrified because I know I'm not perfect. Oh, God, help. No, he says, oh, that's awesome. It's wonderful. Lord, since you know everything, search my heart. Lord, if there's anything in there that doesn't, isn't right, help me. Bring it to my attention. Do you sense the trust you know, the closer we get to him, we, the, the, devil, the way the devil would paint it is the closer we get to him, the scarier it is because we're not, we can't possibly measure up to that. We're not spiritual. This is only for the super saints. But the reality is the closer we get to him, 
the more we understand about his love, his mercy, the provision of Christ is exactly the opposite of the way the devil tells every single one of us every single day. God is inviting us to leave our cage. How about that for a title, leave your cage? But the cage is simply this. We are afraid to die, and that simply means I am afraid to let go of this, of me. This is all I've got. It's what I know. I've, I've, developed, I've, I've developed a coping mechanism with the world. The world will, will not teach you trust, will it? It won't take long before you're going to realize, hey, if anybody's going to pay attention, if, if anybody really cares about me, it's me, ultimately. And so I've got to I've got to fight to carve out a little space for me in this world that, that I can, where I can cope and I can handle it. And it's, it's just, it, it satisfies, my, satisfies my needs up to a certain point. At least I've got a place, a little castle. And I build a moat around it, and I don't let anybody but, but so close. That's human nature. And the Lord says, let it go. Let me in. Let me have it. And I'll bring you out into a large place. You don't have to live that way anymore. Come out of your cage. I'll tell you, may God help us. I, I need this every bit as much as anybody in here, but I, you know, my, my attitude, I, some, I expressed it on Friday night. I said, let's, you know, let's listen to a, a tape and we go home. I don't have anything. But he has something. He has what we need. And every single one of us has the right to go to him today. You didn't earn that. I didn't either. Jesus earned it. Amen. We have the right to go to a throne of the universe. You don't need the Supreme Court. We've got the Supreme Court of the universe we can go to right now. And, our, and our, the basis of our claim for that which we need is not any virtue that's in us. Nothing we have done, nothing we are. It's entirely based upon the cross and what he did in our place. The one who made the star stands beside you with his arm around and says, come on, let's get out of here. I've got a better place, and we're going there. And I have the power to take you, and I love you. To him be the glory. Praise God.